Greetings! Thank you for joining us today for our LSVT Global Webinar. Today's topic is Advanced Parkinson's Disease and Deep Brain Stimulation. How can LSVT Loud and LSVT Big help? We're delighted to have you join us today and we'll go ahead and get started and introduce ourselves as the presenters. My name is Beth Peterson. I'm one of the LSVT Loud Training and Certification faculty members and I've been a part of the clinical research team with LSVT Loud since uh, 2009, where most of that research is done under the direction of Dr. Lorraine Ramig at the National Center for Voice and Speech in Denver. I'm also joined by my colleague, Heather Cianci, and she's a physical therapist at the Dan Aaron Parkinson's Rehab Center, and she's one of the LSVT Big Training and Certification faculty members. So we're very excited to be here today to present to you on the topic and talk to you about some characteristics of both of these um, conditions and then talk about how LSVT Big and LSVT Loud can be applied. So in terms of a plan for the webinar today, I'll first go over some logistics. The handout for the webinar will be available to you. If you didn't receive an email earlier today with that handout, you'll receive an email after the webinar that will include that handout. That way you'll have the slideshow for your reference. Um, it's typically emailed out the same day as the webinar. If you registered late, then you may not have been on that list yet. Um, so you, you'll definitely get it after the webinar, as well as everyone else will go ahead and resend that, just to make sure everybody has the handout. At the end of the webinar, there's also a couple slides that have more information about Heather and myself, so in our instructor biographies, and then some disclosures. Um, if you do have questions during the webinar, and we'll have specific time at the end to ask questions, but if you have questions as we're presenting, there are a few ways to ask your questions. The first is to type in your question, and you can do that by clicking on the question box on your webinar control panel. You can type in your question, and then I'll read it out loud, and either Heather or myself will answer it. The second way to ask a question is to raise your hand, and you can do that by clicking on the hand icon on your webinar control panel. Then I'll call out your first and last name and let you know that I'm going to unmute your microphone and you can ask your question out loud to the group. And speaking of muting, your microphones, everyone in the audience, your microphone is automatically muted just to make sure we don't have background noise from the various environments where you may be joining us. Um, so if you do have a question, then I'll, I would unmute your microphone. Um, so those cover the logistics, and then what we'll really do is get into the heart of the webinar and discuss the application of LSVT Big and LSVT Loud to both advanced Parkinson disease and deep brain stimulation. So we'll first cover some characteristics of both of those populations, and then talk about how LSVT Loud and LSVT Big can be applied. And then we'll have some time at the end to answer your questions. All right, so in terms of learning objectives, um, at the end of this webinar, participants will be able to describe characteristics of both advanced Parkinson's and DBS, explain how advanced Parkinson's and deep brain stimulation may affect movement and communication, and then also be able to provide examples of adaptations used in LSVT Big and LSVT Loud exercises for both advanced Parkinson's and deep brain stimulation. Um, we'll also be able to list ways in which treatment strategies can be tailored to meet the needs of individuals with either advanced Parkinson's disease or deep brain stimulation. All right. Um, so we're going to begin with just a brief discussion of advanced Parkinson's disease and what is considered advanced. So if we look at the honin yar rating scale for Parkinson's disease severity, um, we see a rating scale from 0 to 5, and stage 4 and 5 are what is considered advanced Parkinson's disease. Um, so that would be a more severe disability, um, still able to walk or stand unassisted in stage 4, and then going into stage 5 where individuals may be wheelchair bound or bedridden and less aided. And some additional uh, definitions of advanced Parkinson's or an onset of motor complications despite um, aggressive pharmacological, so despite the drug treatments and also behavior managements. And then patients with advanced Parkinson's have motor and non-motor complications, which can dramatically impact quality of life. And Heather's going to talk about some of those motor characteristics now. Thank you so much, Beth. So when we're talking about the um, advancing characteristics, we're looking at first and foremost from um, a physical therapy standpoint, an occupational therapy standpoint, more difficulty with walking. So we find that a lot of people in these later stages may actually be 
um, in a wheelchair for most of the day or have to sit in a chair and do very, very little walking or actually maybe bed bound. We find that people are having much more difficulty with the number of falls that are occurring, many more episodes with freezing of gait, um, and really not able to live alone at this point. They're really going to need assistance for most daily activities like bathing, getting dressed, preparing meals, and there really is more of a need for different assistive devices and adaptive equipment to help them. We're also seeing more severity of the bradykinesia, which is the slowness of movement, and the hypokinesia, which is the smallness of movement, and the rigidity, which is that stiffness that people feel. And we find that in those later stages, um, unfortunately, the medication can be much less effective. The dosages do not last as long as they once did, and there are more side effects, more complications to being on those medications. Next slide. So some of the non-motor characteristics when we're talking about um, changes that happen um, with that advancing of the disease is cognitive problems. So that can be increased in patients with PD, meaning that there are more problems with memory. There are more problems with processing information. Um, some patients actually have hallucinations or delusions, um, and some patients actually move into the stage of dementia. It's going to take patients longer time to learn new information, to process that information, and then again to respond to questions that we are asking them. Next slide. And we'll move back to Beth for the speech characteristics. All right, thanks Heather. And so with some of the speech characteristics, what we're seeing early on in the earlier stages of Parkinson's is we see some reduced loudness, mono loudness, also monotone and pitch, and that hoarse, harsh, or breathy voice quality. And those continue on into the later stages as well. And um, when we get into those more later stages, we're also seeing um, imprecise articulation and vocal tremor or uh, issues with rate that we weren't seeing earlier on in the course of the disease. Some of the other characteristics that we're seeing are what we have, have seen as a repetitive speech phenomena. So this is disfluent speech or stuttering-like speech. So it can be some initiation difficulties or inappropriate silences during speech. And then also hyperfluent speech um, known as paleolalia. And I have a video of this so that it will um, come to life a little more for you. But this are compulsive, effortless repetitions of words and phrases. And then there's a background of increasing rate and loudness um, throughout the utterance. And the word and phrase repetitions tend to occur at the end of an utterance. Um, there might also be increased time for processing information and responding. So let's go ahead and take a look at that video um, of a gentleman with advanced Parkinson's disease. And he's exhibiting paleolalia. <laughs> been diagnosed with Parkinson's. When was that diagnosis made? Okay, what were your first symptoms? First symptoms was back I was sitting down on a bench. When did you first notice a change in your speech or your voice that you would associate with Parkinson's? I didn't notice it. My wife noticed it. And when did she notice it? Oh, probably. 84, 85. Okay, very good. Count from 1 to 25 for me. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 22, 23, 24, 25, 25, 25, 25, 25, 25, 25, 25, 25, 25, 25, 25, 25, 25, 25, 25, 25, 25, 25, 25, 25, 25, 25, 25, 25, 25, 25, 25, 25, 25, 25, 25, 25, 25, 25, 25, 25, 25, 25, 25, 25, 25, 25, 25, 25, 25, 25, 25, 25, 25, 25, 25, 25, 25, 25, 25, 25, 25, 25, 25, 25, 25, 25, 25, 25, 25, 25, 25, 25, 25, 25, 25, 25, 25, 25, 25, 25, 25, 25, 25, 25, 25, 25, 25, and then you saw the paleolalia where he had those quick repetitive um, utterances throughout, throughout his speaking. So next we're going to talk about deep brain simulation and just go over some of the characteristics there. Um, so deep brain simulation uses a surgically implanted medical device and it delivers electrical stimulation to a targeted area in the brain. It electrically stimulates specific structures that control unwanted symptoms. Um, and these are a couple images that nicely show uh, the placement of electrodes. And on the left here, you have uh, a placement in the globus pallidus. And on the right, you have it in the subthalamic nucleus. And this is what it looks like in an individual um, that has undergone the surgery. So it's connected to a neurostimulator. 
you can see these under the clavicle here, um, like a pacemaker type device. And it can be done unilaterally or bilaterally, and it consists of multiple surgeries to place the electrodes and the stimulators. In terms of who makes a good candidate, um, an individual must be responsive to medication, and that can really be the best outcome predictor for a response to deep brain stimulation. Um, someone whose medication is no longer providing enough relief from symptoms, despite trials of different doses, um, et cetera, and at least five years since the time of diagnosis. Um, most frequently, it's between about 10 to 15 years, and getting into stage four is most typical, but um, some people do have it done in stage three, and dementia is the most frequent exclusion criteria, um, and that is uh, found from a neuropsychological screening. And we do have, uh, we like to look at these three circles that intertwine here. And to provide symptomatic relief and improve function, we have both the pharmacological treatments, so the drug treatments that individuals are on, and the neurosurgeries combined with voice and body exercise to really uh, have the best outcome for individuals with Parkinson's. And so these can all be used in conjunction. Um, and so we like to show how voice and body exercise really can play a big part in managing symptoms of the disease even if individuals are on medication or have had uh, deep brain stimulation. So I'll go ahead and pass it back to Heather and she'll go over some of the motor characteristics um, that are seen after individuals receive DBS. So thank you, Beth. Um, some of the things that happen after DBS, you know, unfortunately it is not a cure for Parkinson's disease. It sort of just kind of turns back the hands of time a little bit and it really only does return patients to their best on time, meaning that when you were on your medication and feeling at your best, that's generally what you can hope to accept um, after that DBS. Now, it can be very helpful with reducing and controlling rigidity, the bradykinesia or akinesia, um, very helpful for tremor and dyskinesia. And what's really nice is that patients often are taking less medication so with less medication, there are less side effects, and that's why it really helps to reduce that dyskinesia. Now, if function was a problem because it was limited by the tremor or dystonia or the dyskinesia, um, we can really see some improvements in the patient's ability to function better. Unfortunately, it's not as effective on gait, freezing of gait, balance, and falls. And in a subset of patients, it can actually be worse. It can actually um, lead to more problems with balance and falls. And unfortunately, again, it can lead to new episodes of dystonia. So people who did not have dystonia prior to the surgery can end up with dystonia following the surgery. Next slide, please. Some of the non-motor characteristics that are found after patients have DBS is we know through the research is that depression can become a big problem um, after the surgery as well as apathy where people are less interested in activities around them, less motivated and not really feeling like they want to do much. Impulsivity can be another problem after DBS surgery where um, people really aren't thinking clearly about the safety of their movements and their um, reacting very quickly to things. And then unfortunately, we also see a worsening of executive functioning, meaning that people have difficulty with actually observing that they're having difficulty in themselves and they're not figuring out new ways of correcting what they're doing. So although DBS itself can be a wonderful um, adjunct treatment to Parkinson's disease, it does come with some negative side effects. Next slide. So what is the difference with movement quality after DBS? What am I as a physical therapist noticing in my patients? Well, I'm seeing that people have really a, a new increased freedom of movement, whereas they were once too slow or too small, now their movements actually become more free. Um, we see that people who had problems with more of a bent over posture can get an increased extension, so people are able to move to a, a better standing posture. Um, but sometimes we see these wild movement patterns in some people, again, looking back at that impulsivity, where those movements get really too big, and um, it is our job as physical therapists and as occupational therapists using LSVT big to teach people how to control those movements. And because of this, the risk for falls can really be increased. And we're going to take a look in the next slide about some research that talks about kind of what is going on um, with falls and fear of falling with DBS. And this was a recent survey that was done by the Parkinson's Alliance. And they looked at a really large group of people with deep brain stimulation and people without. They represented all 50 states. And what was nice about this study is that they had 
a really mixed group of patients where they had people from the age of 50 onwards plus 70, so um, younger onset and older. Um, they, when they looked at the patients for controlling for the age and how long they actually had the disease, they found that those people with the DBS actually had an increased fear of falls and they had 2.5, two times the risk of falling compared to their people with Parkinson's who did not have the DBS. And they found that the longer time you were diagnosed with Parkinson's, the greater frequency of falls you ended up with. And that people were reporting themselves that they were having more difficulty with mobility, speech, and feeling stigmatized following the DBS surgery. Let's take a look at the next slide and we'll explain a little bit about these findings. And the implications really show that um, individuals with deep brain stimulation therapy may have extra ability to move without those functional impairments. So less rigidity, less bradykinesia, less hypokinesia. Um, but they lack the feedback and the control to actually move safely. So it means that people are becoming more confident and they're becoming more capable to increase their engagement in activities because they have less motor symptoms, but that these individuals are actually neglecting to attend to or take into account those other continued difficulties that are still there. So meaning that you may be feeling more confident and feeling that you can move faster and you can move bigger, but you still have that underlying difficulty of poor balance. So moreover, even though that the DBS therapy can benefit some of the motor functions, the body and functional capacity still may be constrained by other factors. And then this in turn then results in those increased falls. So there's a whole learning curve of new ways of learning how to move and to speak after DBS surgery. Next slide. All right, so some of the speech characteristics that we're seeing post-DBS. Um, what we're seeing with speech is that the neurosurgical intervention, so DBS, doesn't consistently or effectively improve speech in Parkinson's, and that while some individual components of speech may improve, such as loudness of sustained phonation, so ah, uh, that may improve, or oral force of tongue, the overall speech intelligibility is not improved as a result of the surgery. And speech problems, specifically dysarthria, are reported after the surgery um, between 5 and 61% of cases. So the impact on speech is highly variable depending on different parameters. So the contact placement, um, the voltage amplitude settings, the medication that an individual is on, whether the surgery was unilateral or bilateral, and then also the severity of Parkinson's disease going into the surgery, and the severity of the speech disorder going into the surgery. And I'll talk more about LSVT loud specifically um, with individuals with DBS. But one consideration is, and we talk to our clinicians about this, treating individuals before they undergo DBS. So kind of pre-treating them with LSVT loud to give them the optimal um, voice and communication before going into DBS, and then um, post-DBS they would get LSVT loud again, depending on um, what types of voice and communication issues they have following the surgery, but that's something um, that we tell our clinicians to try to do um, with, with patients. Some other speech characteristics that you may see, there's some significant differences in severity of perceived speech disturbance, and more severe symptoms are typically reported. There's also more symptom interference with social interaction and daily experiences relating to functional, physical, and emotional issues of a voice disorder. So the um, activities of daily living can be more difficult um, with the voice disorder going on in um, functional situations. Low volume was the most common speech symptom, and then DBS also had the greatest adverse impact on slurred speech. So in terms of a consensus on medical management with Parkinson's, what we're seeing in terms of speech is that the magnitude and consistency of any speech improvement with either drugs or the surgery are not the same as limb improvement. So we may be seeing some motor improvements um, that don't carry over or go into speech as much as they do, um, again, with the motor, motor improvements there. So we'll now kind of turn the webinar to focusing on how LSVT loud and LSVT big can be applied to these populations, to both advanced Parkinson disease and deep brain stimulation. And we'll go ahead and start with LSVT big. Thank you, Beth. So this is just an overview slide to let you know what an LSVT big treatment session looks like. And what you see on the one side of your slide are what we call our maximal daily exercises. And those are seven exercises where we are working on step size, the reach of the arms, balance, strength, 
endurance, you know, we're really working the body to its full potential. And then we move into something on the other side of the slide, you'll see there are functional component tasks. And these are five everyday tasks that everyone needs to do, which one of them is sit to stand. And then the other four we pick with you. We help you to figure out, well, what are you having difficulty with? Is it um, reaching for a drink, pulling up the covers, reaching to get a tissue out of the tissue box? What is the challenge that you're having? So they're more simple one-step tasks. And then we move into our hierarchy tasks. And again, these are patient identified, and these are things that people want to get better with being able to do. So perhaps it's getting out of the bed and being able to transfer to the bedside commode. Maybe it's the ability to transfer from the wheelchair to the toilet. Maybe it's the ability to just get in and out of the car. And we work with you over those four weeks of treatment towards your long-term goal of being able to actually accomplish those tasks, whether it's you performing it independently or with help. And then, of course, we work on big walking. Now, in the cases of people with advanced PD, it may be that that person needs a rollator or some sort of an assisted device, or it may be that that patient now is in the stage where they're using a wheelchair for mobility. So we still do big mobility depending on where people are. So that is our basics of the treatment session. Let's take a look at the next slide and talk a little bit more about how we will adapt that and what we need to do and why we really need to do that. Well, the first one is, is we see a lot of challenges uh, with people with advanced PD. Typically, people are older and we have more what we call comorbidities, so other diagnoses, um, maybe peripheral neuropathy, maybe um, joint problems, maybe a knee replacement. Um, maybe you already had an underlying comorbidity. You already had a, an old back injury that's now worsening with time and with age. Uh, there may be new challenges with pain. It may be, again, um, that you're having worsening dyskinesia. There's more dystonia and there's more tremor. We talked before about the cognitive issues that can come with advancing Parkinson's, the difficulty with motor planning, and then something known as orthostatic hypotension, and that is a sudden drop of blood pressure when someone goes from um, a lying position to a seated position or seated to standing. So um, a change in that blood pressure can make you feel really dizzy and unsteady. And then there are increases with visual disturbances, um, maybe with double vision, a little more uh, blurriness of vision. There may be difficulties also with those um, hallucinations of thinking that we're seeing things that are not there. So let's talk in the next slide a little bit more about this. And, you know, why is it that with these challenges we need to use these adaptations? Um, you know, why don't we expect everyone to do these exercises the same way? Well, because we know that everyone is an individual and that we need to make sure that people are feeling safe. So we want to eliminate your fear of falling. We want you to feel confident that you're going to be successful in what you're doing. So we want to really positively reinforce what quality of movement is available for you, that we really can improve your functional ability. And we want to have more care partner involvement. So if that person really is in need of someone to cue them more, to put a hand on them, to help them feel a little more safe or to feel secure, then we want to make sure that we are putting those adaptations into place for success and for safety. Next slide. So things that you may see your therapist do if you're in those later stages um, and more advanced stages that we need to work on or if you're having um, new issues from the DBS is it may be that your therapist is going to work with you in a much more quiet room where there are less um, people around watching, where there are less distractions. Maybe your care partner is not even with you in the beginning so we can just focus on you. We can adapt all of the exercises and I'll show you on a slide upcoming um, that those exercises do not have to be performed in standing. They can be adapted to a seated position or even a lying in bed position. We will decrease the number of repetitions and we won't make you hold those exercises so long. And then over time, we hope that when you're with us over those 16 or more sessions that we're able to improve that. Um, people in those later stages are going to need probably more verbal and environmental cueing, meaning that we're saying more, we're telling you more of what to do, we're giving you cues in your environment. Maybe we're putting a piece of tape on the ground to say, okay, this is where we need you to reach, or a piece of tape on the table. This is how far I need you to reach. We're going to give you a little more physical guidance, so more hands-on. And we also can break these exercises down. They don't need to be done in one full swoop. We can break them down into just performing the 
arms, and then we can perform them just performing with the lower body or the legs. We're going to work in repetition, 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 so that there's much more time for processing and for learning that new material. It's likely that that treatment session will go beyond those 16 visits or those four weeks. Um, some people need that little extra time just to make sure that everything is really um, well set with them. And we, again, really do a lot of training with care partners, whether that's a loved one or a paid caregiver um, or whoever's helping you. We're really training that care partner to be that coach at home with you to help you do that. Next slide. So I'm taking the first exercise here in the standing category that we do, which is what we call a multi-directional repetitive exercise. And this is the forward step and reach. In the top slide, all the way up on the left, that is um, the full exercise where people will take a big step forward, they'll pull their arms back big, they'll stand up big and open their hands big. Now, if we need to adapt that for someone who's having problems with balance, you can see in the next picture going down, someone can hold on to a chair, onto a counter, um, hold on to a sturdy piece of furniture, and then we can just do one side and switch to the other side. Now, when we move down to that third picture, you can see we can adapt that further into a seated position where we are still working on that big posture, that big reach out with the legs, and that big pullback with the arms and the hands. And then ultimately, we can adapt it down even further for people who need to begin these exercises in bed. We can work on that big movement of the leg coming up and that big opening of the arms. Because even if someone is in a very late stage of the disease and is spending most of their time in bed, we need to ensure that that person has safe and efficient movement to roll over in bed, to get out of the bed, to get to the toilet to be able to move around and get comfortable. So you can see with all of these, we can really adapt them to whatever need is there. Next slide. So LSVT, big, and DBS, what, what should we do? Are we looking at making sure that people are getting the LSVT big before? Or are we looking at making sure that they're getting it after the DBS? Now, Beneficial reasons that a lot of people who are going to have DBS will start with LSVT big is really to maximize their functional level with those exercises before considering the more invasive options. So it may be that your physician wants to establish a baseline activity level before surgery. It may be that they want to get you into a much better functional level um, and much healthier level prior to doing the surgery. Now for those people, Beneficial afterwards, really, that is going to be there, the LSVT big, to help you with those problems with balance issues and really to help you to retrain normal, appropriate size and control of your movement. So when we talk about the people who end up with um, almost excessive movement and have that difficulty with the increase in falls, that's what we're really there for with the LSVT big after the DBS, to really maximize the functional abilities with the combination of the therapy and your surgical options together. So many, many good reasons for having it prior to the surgery and again after surgery. Next slide. So for things that we're looking at after DBS, um, for your therapist, it's going to be really important that your therapist is modeling and showing you good movement and that they're shaping you, meaning they're touching you. And it's going to be very important to help with that, with the exercises and with your functional movements. Um, we're going to need to cue you, meaning talking to you, so that you're keeping better control and you're keeping that good, appropriate size of your movement. And that we're really thinking about how are we demonstrating and how are we showing you what the movement pattern looks like with your functional processes. So if it is getting in and out of the car, if it is getting on and off the toilet, um, whatever functional focus you want to work on and um, any kind of gait. So any kind of gait with or without the device. And again, um, we're there to help make those movements appropriate and safe for you with the LSVT big. Next slide. And again, remember that those balance deficits really may still persist despite the DBS. Um, and with a, a number of patients, we actually see that balance problems are more increased. So it means that we really need to continue to repeat what we're doing with you and work with you over and over again to learn that appropriate size of movement and for you to relearn motor control. 
Um, I mentioned this before again, but freezing generally still persists after DBS surgery. And we need to make sure as therapists that if you're still having those episodes of freezing of gait after DBS, that we are including what we call freezing triggers, meaning if you freeze going through a doorway or you freeze when you're in a small space or when you turn, we are going to continue to work with you in those situations to help you use the LSVT big to break free from those freezing episodes. Next slide. And again, it's really important that we need to make sure before working with you that you're stable with your DBS setting. So it doesn't mean that you're going to have your DBS surgery and then two days later you're going to be jumping right into LSVT big therapy. It means that your physician and your programmer makes sure that you're at your best setting, that everything is stable in that. So we're going to really stay in communication with your medical team. Um, regarding any kind of changes in programming that we see um, or recommend because of things that we see in therapy. We may see that um, you're having more tremor than you had two weeks ago before they reprogrammed you, or we may be noticing that there are new episodes of dystonia. So it's really important that during the LSVT big that everyone is communicating in a really healthy manner to make sure that we're keeping you on the best path as possible. Next slide. So I'm going to take a little time here and talk to you about a patient that we worked with to give you a little insight into what a session would look like. Uh, this patient's name is Laura. Of course, it's been changed to keep her privacy. And she was 79 at the time we saw her and had had Parkinson's for um, almost 16 years. So she was um, into the much later stages of the disease process. She had recently um, not been able to live on her own anymore and needed to move in with her older sister. You can see she was 82 um, and needed 24-hour supervision. Her children lived too far from her, and the best option was really for her to move in with her sister and get some um, paid caregiving services. She was walking with uh, assistance, and she had an aide um, who was helping her with bathing and dressing and really helping her with all of her activities of daily living. At the stage that we saw her, she was already starting to have moderate cognitive impairments and was very excited. So with talking with Laura and her sister and her caregiver, um, the goals that everybody agreed upon was that we were really trying to increase Laura's participation in transfers and in her activities of daily living so that she would be more independent with this, so that the caregiver didn't have to do everything for her. She would be able to help herself with some guidance. We wanted to increase her quality of gait so that she was really able to get to the bathroom in a safe and timely manner. Uh, remember, she was already having some cognitive difficulties and often um, would move too quickly um, to get to the bathroom when she felt the need to go. And we really wanted her care partners of her sister and the caregiver to be able to model those exercises, so to be her coach and to be able to safely provide her the cues that she needed so that she wouldn't need so much assistance with her transfers and her gait. And we really wanted to keep her sister and that caregiver safe. We wanted not to have any kind of back injury for them. Next slide. So when we broke down her functional component tasks, so this is what we all came up with together. Of course, sit to stand was one of them. Um, knees up and down when she was lying on her back, so her ability to bend her knees in bed, the ability to be able to roll from side to side in the bed. And then we wanted her to be able to have that ability to move from lying on her back in the bed to being able to sit up on the edge of the bed safer. So a lot of bed mobility related. And then lifting her feet to get them into the car. So she wanted to be able, in her long-term goals or her hierarchies here, as you can see in number one, was getting in and out of the car with not so much assistance, but more with cues from her care partners, as well as being able to get in and out of bed, again, with cues from the care partners, um, because they were really doing the bulk of the transferring, and she wasn't able to help that much. So again, really looking to have her perform more of this task with less physical assistance, but more verbal assistance. Next slide. So how did we adapt things for Laura? What did we need to do? Well, we needed to begin with all of the exercises with less repetitions, and we didn't hold things for that long because she would fatigue very easily. She wasn't able to perform all of those exercises in standing, 
Um, so we performed three exercises with her holding on to a chair and standing, and two she performed in a seated position. All of her tasks in her hierarchy were broken down into small, very, very simple steps. There was much more cueing needed, meaning that we needed to talk to her more, touch her more, and facilitate movement more. And she ended up needing an extra week of treatment to get through everything. Next slide. By the time she was in week number five of the program, we had um, really made some wonderful progress. You can see that we were able to increase her repetitions and hold times. Um, by week five, she was only needing to perform one exercise with holding the chair and one in sitting. So she was able to do more in standing. Her caregiver was performing all the exercises, the functional component tasks um, with the patient. And it was wonderful because she really was able to now almost um, be that model for that person so the PT no longer was having to be the one doing it. She was practicing the full motion of getting in and out of the car, not just the small steps of it. She practiced the whole movement. She practiced also fully getting in and out of bed, again, not just the small movements. Um, by week five, also really focusing on less physical assistance, but more from the caregivers, um, providing cues for her to move in a big way. And she was actually able to walk now with Minisys and cues. So she made some nice goals. And we'll take a look on the next slide about how um, she really progressed even further. So you can see that on the left side of your screen were some of the variables, some of the things we were working on. So her first one was a test we call five times sit to stand, where the patient is asked to stand up and sit down five times um, as quickly but as safely as possible. Now, there are norms for how fast someone should be able to do that. And those are indicators for us as therapists as to the functional ability. You can see that before her LSVT big, she was not able to perform that. And after her five weeks of treatment, she was independently doing that. Now, it took her longer. You can see it took 80 seconds. But the fact that she was not able to do it five weeks ago really speaks volumes about her ability. When we were looking at her ability to get in and out of bed, it was taking moderate to maximal assistance of her caregiver. Um, so a lot of effort on that caregiver's part. And when she was done treatment, she was able to do that with just minimal assistance, meaning that she was doing actually 75% of the work. Car transfers, again, almost total assistance of someone lifting her and moving her. And you can see beautifully she was able to then, again, move down to minimal assistance with cueing. And when we lastly look at gait, in the beginning, min to moderate assistance, so someone doing a good 50% of the work to now minimal assistance, where Laura really was able to do 75% of the work with the walking. So she made some wonderful, wonderful advances, even though she was in the later stages and even though she was having some cognitive difficulties. Next slide. All right, thanks, Heather. I'm going to pass this over. Yeah, thank you for that great overview with LSVT Big Adaptations and that nice case presentation. So we'll now turn it over and look at some of the adaptations that can be used during the LSVT Loud exercises. And we also have an LSVT Loud treatment slide to show you the different exercises that we do in a session. And then we'll talk about how some of these exercises can be adapted. Um, so with LSVT Loud, we begin with daily exercises. The first one is a maximum duration of sustained vowel phonation, so saying Ah, uh, and a loud voice with healthy voice quality. We do that for a minimum of 15 repetitions. Next, we do a maximum fundamental frequency range, which we call our high and low ahs. So that would be ah uh, is a high, and ah uh, is a low, and we do multiple repetitions of each of those. The next one are maximum functional speech loudness um, phrase tasks, and so we do what are called functional phrases using that same loud voice that's done with those first two daily exercises and phrases that are commonly said every single day um, for, a, for an individual. And with these two populations that we're talking about here today, these um, phrases become very important be because sometimes they are really one of the end goals that a patient will get to. So we really spend a lot of time on those functional phrases, things that they're saying every day to individuals in their, in their everyday living. Um, so that's the first half of an LSVT loud session. The second half of every session are what we call the hierarchy exercises. Um, so with loud, with LSVT loud, what we're doing are structured reading tasks. Um, so beginning in week one, we start with 
using that loud voice at a word or short phrase level and progress as far as a patient can go, um, whether that's all the way to full conversation using a loud voice um, or getting to a phrase level using a loud voice, um, depending on the severity of the, the voice and speech difficulties. Um, and then sometimes we may need some cueing that we'll talk about a little bit later um, from other caregivers or su support team. We also do some what we call off-the-cuff questions, and that's where we uh, have individuals use their loud voice in conversational um, situations throughout the uh, progression of treatment. Um, so we kind of just, we like to say we sprinkle in questions throughout the session to see if we're able to get that loud voice um, in responses as well as to those more structured reading tasks. We also have homework and carryover exercises, which are assigned all 30 days of the month to make sure that an individual is using that loud voice in their home or daily living environment. So I'm going to show you the video. Um, we saw the gentleman at the beginning of the webinar, um, his pre-LSVT loud video. So now we'll look at, we'll just catch the tail end of his pre, and so you can again hear what he sounded like, and then we'll look at what he sounds like post-LSVT loud. And this is a gentleman with advanced Parkinson's disease. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, 24, 25, 25, 25, 25, 25, 25, 25, 25, 25, 25, 25, 25, 25, Count from 1 to 25 for me. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, 24, 25. Oh. He told you it's easier to understand you? Yes. Who? Oh, my daughter and all my wife. What have they said? Tell me that again. I said I completely understood. Is that right? Yeah, I hope All so. Right. All right, so with him we saw uh, some nice improvements. The loudness improved, um, the rate was improved, so it was much easier to hear him, um, especially counting that 1 to 25. So let's go ahead and take a look. This is an individual. Um, he had undergone DBS. He was not pre-treated with LSVT loud. So this is post-DBS. And we'll see him pre-LSVT loud and post-LSVT loud. The gentleman is actually speaking Hebrew. So if you do not speak Hebrew, you may not recognize what he's saying. But the real takeaway from the video is how, um, how much improvement you can hear in his voice. And I think it's a really good example of that. So let's take a look at him. Okay, so I hope you could hear some of the differences there, um, really with that loudness and voice quality improving um, pre to post. And so those are some outcomes that um, we may see in, in individuals with advanced Parkinson's and then the video you just saw with deep brain simulation. So we'll break down the um, exercises that are done in a treatment session and how we can adapt those um, for individuals. So sometimes we may need to spend more time shaping the awe, so to get that nice, good quality, loud awe. Um, durations may be shorter, especially in the beginning. Um, we may provide for longer rest periods between repetitions. And then also more extensive and um, prolonged need for modeling and shaping to really make sure that we get that exercise as healthy and as good of quality as possible. With the fundamental frequency range, so those are the highs and the lows, sometimes these exercises may actually open the door to improve voice quality in that sustained valve phonation or that ah. Sometimes doing those highs and lows can actually improve again that voice and kind of take it back to improve that ah. 
um, there's sometimes a greater tendency to not start at that max awe. And so as clinicians, we may need to reset that exercise more frequently um, to help you get into the groove of that um, using that loud voice. And there may, again, with these uh, exercises, also be more extensive and prolonged need for the clinician to really model and shape to get that good, healthy um, vocal production. With those functional phrases, um, so these again are 10 phrases that a, an individual comes up with. We may use family input to create those phrases, and if we do use family members, we need to make sure um, that the phrases are phrases that the individual does say every day, and not what the spouse would like them to say or the caregiver, um, so to make sure that the patient really will say these every day especially again um, with these more advanced populations, sometimes that functional phrase level is really what we're trying to get at at the end of treatment. So these phrases are really important to make sure that individuals are saying them outside of treatment. And we may actually do them more than um, the typical five times that we do in a treatment session, as again, these will be some key phrases um, and key outcomes for, for these patients. For the speech hierarchy, some of the um, reading material may be adjusted. We may do more repetition of words and phrases. I'm using picture descriptions, so you know, here's a picture, can you tell me all the items in the picture or use a sentence to describe the scene in the picture, so that's um, something that we may use. And then making sure that there's sufficient time um, for thinking and, and responding. And we may go back to that awe exercise more frequently to rev up that system. So um, if we're noticing that the volume is dropping when an individual is getting to that level of the, the reading task, we may say, okay, let's do a nice loud awe and then say, what's for dinner? So awe, what's for dinner? Um, to really pair back to that and get that whole system revved up to use that loud voice in um, functional speech. Um, for calibration, so this is, um, calibration is a component of the treatment um, where we calibrate patients to use the new loud voice in everyday situations. So that's a big component of the treatment beginning on day one of treatment to make sure that individuals are comfortable and will use this new loud voice. So sometimes it can be more challenging, but it's just as important um, with these more advanced populations. And then educating individuals on the voice or speech impairment um, can be more difficult, so it's really important to really make sure um, that individuals are understanding that they're too soft, but this new loud voice is not a voice that's too loud. So with this calibration, we're calibrating them to that new level of loudness um, and, and the effort it takes to get there. We often play back um, audio recordings during the treatment session to help with that calibration, and sometimes it's not as easily perceived um, with these individuals, so we'll be doing more playback um, really getting into that to make sure individuals do hear the differences there. And it's really critical to find emotionally salient opportunities so that um, individuals do feel the reward of improved communication. So some treatment strategies and considerations that we may also be doing um, is utilizing support from family and caregivers, nursing staff, um, depending on what type of uh, living situation the individual is in, and then also training others on how to cue and what appropriate levels of cueing would be. Um, so that it's not that we're trying to have a caregiver be another speech therapist for the patient, um, but rather we're going to train them on ways um, and, and kind of the amount of speech that is appropriate for them to cue. So depending on the level that a patient gets to in treatment, if they're getting to a level where they can use a loud voice um, for a, a couple words or a phrase or a sentence, that would be a level where we would train the caregiver to cue for loud speech. Um, if uh, we, we wouldn't want a caregiver to um, cue for loud speech on every single sentence or utterance that a patient said. So that would be something that the clinician would work with you and the family members on to make sure that you're all on the same page there. Um, it can also be good to sometimes treat individuals at times when they may not be feeling their best, um, because even when they're not feeling your best, you need to communicate at those times. So it can be a good um, doing a session even on those times to make sure that you feel that confidence to communicate even when you're not feeling your best. In terms of treatment location, so things to think about um, if there's any cognition deficits or distractibility issues, um, making sure that you're really limiting distractions. Um, also, if it's possible for the clinician to treat in a home environment, that can be even better because we know that we're really um, carrying over that loud voice into everyday living because you're in that everyday living environment um, versus a clinic setting. So that's something to think about. If there are transportation issues, so what, um, so what, what should we do if individuals have trouble getting to treatment? And um, one thing that we, we talk about is doing telehealth sessions or sessions over the internet. 
Um, so if transportation can be an issue, getting in and out of the car, um, we can do some sessions, um, either again coming to the home environment or doing telehealth sessions where we see you, um, you're, you're on your computer and the clinician is on the other end and we can actually do some of the treatment sessions that way. Um, so some of those adaptations for those concerns, again making sure there's as few distractions as possible, beginning treatment without observers to really make sure that the individual um, really kind of takes responsibility and, and can reap the rewards of successful treatment, um, but certainly having observers later if we're going to be using those care partners um, for some cueing. Uh, we want clinicians to be modeling the exercises for the patient, um, so using as few uh, kind of explanations as possible, but really focusing on that model and have the individual copy that model. Use environmental cues as loud, lots and lots of repetition. And just like with LSVT big, we likely will treat into week five, maybe maybe even into week six, so adding another week of treatment to really get to that best outcome possible. And then once a patient is able to follow the clinician modeling, that's when we really educate the care partner so they can be another coach at home. And um, for those physical concerns that we mentioned, telehealth sessions can be great to reduce fatigue from traveling. I'm um, also even just acknowledging that a client may become more fatigued. We talked to clinicians about this. Um, so validate those feelings of fatigue. There may be longer rest periods in between exercises. Um, and then also we make sure that our clinicians are really advocates for clients' um, speech and being in contact with that medical team. Um, and then don't give up on behavioral treatments. They can really be a huge component of helping um, with these communication issues. LSVT Loud Plus, so we mentioned that there might be more treatment sessions in addition to the typical four weeks of treatment. Uh, individuals may have more frequent and continuous follow-up, um, so you may continue to see a speech therapist uh, every month or two months or three months, um, and that might just be a quick, what we call a tune-up session. You just go in one time, kind of get back into that loud voice, and then you're okay to to, to try it on your own again, and then they'll call you up again in a couple months and see how you're doing, maybe bring you back in. So there's more frequent and continuous follow-up um, after treatment's concluded. Um, we may use some augmentative device supplementation. Um, so if needed, we'll have um, communication devices to help make sure that an individual can um, communicate in a way that is safe, um, safe and functional for them. I'll show you a quick video on pacing. This is a strategy we may use um, to also help with communication. In addition to getting that loud voice, this can be a nice way to, to help with that rate. Um, and then you also may need some additional cues, as we mentioned, um, from either the clinician and then once you get, once you're finished with treatment, having those cues from other care partners. So let's look at a pacing uh, strategy here. Um, and this is an individual um, who is going through LSVT loud and also his therapist used this pacing board. How do you say the and maybe. And this is the thing I'm playing with. I'm going to I'm going to have to the and I'm going to have to I'm going to have to the and I'm going to have to the and I'm going to have to the Tell me a little bit about your experience here. This is session 15. We have one more session tomorrow. Yes. Tell me what you've learned from the therapy that you've done. For some I have a done, and talk slowly. Uh-huh. Use this board. Okay. I want you to say that again, using the board. I learned to use this board to Slow myself down. Good. Okay. All right. So you saw the example of what he sounded like pre-treatment and then how that board was really a helpful strategy for him um, to, to improve not only his um, loudness with the treatment, but also that was improving his rate so he was more easily understood. So really what um, we're seeing is that multiple necessary teams are key. Um, so you have your medical team. Um, especially if you've had the neurosurgery, so we have the neurologist, neurosurgeon, um, other uh, medical providers, and then your allied health team, which are the speech language pathologists, the physical therapists, the occupational therapists. Um, you may have a neuropsychologist, social worker, nutritionist. And um, so this, this teamwork is really key in getting to the best 
possible outcomes for both movement, um, communication, and overall um, quality of life. So behavioral intervention is the most effective therapy for improving communication. As we were mentioning, the, the drugs don't help with communication and the surgeries don't. So using that behavioral intervention um, is really key um, to improve that communication. So just a quick summary, with both LSVT Big and LSVT Loud, these can be applied to advanced Parkinson's disease and post deep brain stimulation, and they can be really customized to each individual's needs and different treatment settings. Both treatments can also increase independence, quality of life, um, and or safety with activities of daily living. And really we want to restore function, improve function, maintain function. We want to make um, individual's life as functional and efficient as possible um, and, and safety as well. And with these populations, we do see that they do carry unique challenges that can require some creative solutions and increased caregiver involvement. So we do have some time here at the end for us to address your questions. Um, so you can type in the question box on your webinar control panel. Um, you can also raise your hand on your webinar control panel. If you think of questions at the end of the webinar, you can also email us, and that's info at lsvtglobal.com. And we can always address your questions uh, after the webinar as well. All right, so let me just pull up some questions here. Uh, we've seen a couple come through. All right, so um, a very important question. So how do we receive LSVT loud or LSVT big therapy? Um, so with LSVT big and LSVT loud on our website, so if you go to lsvtglobal.com, um, and there's a tool on our website that's the find the clinician tool. And if you click on that tool, um, you can search for either LSVT loud or LSVT big providers. And so you'll um, click on which type of provider you're interested in. And then you can also type in the location, um, so where you're living or where you'd like to receive treatment. Um, and then you'll see a list of clinicians that pop up. Um, and so there should be contact information with the clinicians. And you can call or email them. Um, and some questions that I like to ask clinicians, um, especially for these more advanced um, populations, First thing, just how many patients that they've treated in general with LSVT loud or LSVT big, um, what their outcomes have been, and then specifically if they've treated patients um, post DBS or with advanced Parkinson's disease, because some of those outcomes are a little bit different um, than if we were earlier on in, this, in, in the course of the disease. So it's good to get an idea of if they have also had some experience with, um, with these other populations as well. Okay, um, and then another question that came up, um, is therapy typically reimbursed? Um, so Heather, if you want to go on ahead and take that question. Yes, thank you, Beth. So yes, therapy is typically reimbursed. Um, if you have Medicare, uh, Medicare will pay 80% and your secondary will pay 20%. Now there are, um, of course, rules and regulations. If you have an HMO or a PPO, um, they may limit how many visits you have and where you can go. So I always tell everyone, um, please call your healthcare provider first to see um, what your coverage options are. Uh, but it is very rare that someone does not have both LSVT loud and LSVT big covered by their insurance carrier. All right, great. Thank you, Heather. And so a few other questions came in. Um, so there was one slide, I think I missed this point. So what is the altered auditory feedback listed under LSVT Loud Plus? So that might be um, where we provide feedback um, to the patient during treatment. Um, and then, so some type of biofeedback. And then the, the patient will uh, respond using their loud voice to try to match that biofeedback. Um, so, for example, we have a program where um, on our screen it shows you how loud your voice is. And uh, so we want to make sure that you can match up to that line um, that a clinician is showing you to match with your loud voice. Um, so some of those extra tools um, to help you uh, use your loud voice. Um, we've also had like a, a light that comes on when you use the, the voice that we are asking you to use. So that can be another tool that can be used there. Um, so let me see another question that came through. Um, 
And Heather, if you want to take this one, should I be doing LSVT big and LSVT loud even though I am not in advanced Parkinson's yet? Um, this, this individual has had deep brain stimulation. Oh, fantastic question, and thank you for asking that. Um, absolutely. Um, the research shows that we can help people at all stages, but we know that people who are in the earlier stages do tend to have more of a robust response to it. So even if you're early on in the disease process, there is always something that we as therapists can work on with you and to help to establish a really good baseline of um, vocal healthiness and functional movement quality and safety. So absolutely, please um, take a look at our website at lsbtglobal.com and see if you can hook up with a therapist in your area. All right, great. Thank you, Heather. Um, so this next one, um, has there been any research done with regards to outcomes with advanced Parkinson's or post-DBS with traditional LSVT loud versus extended LSVT loud um, where it was done two times a week for eight weeks? Um, would the extended plan be better due to fatigue? That's a really great question. Um, so there has been research done, um, what this um, individual is asking about is extended LSVT Loud was a program that was researched and was found to have um, great outcomes just like traditional LSVT Loud where patients did come in only two times a week but it was for eight weeks. Um, what we do say to clinicians and also to patients, um, so even though that method is less amounts of time in person, there was so much homework uh, with those individuals that it ended up being quite a bit of time for both the clinician and the patient to be spending on that homework as well. Um, and also, I would almost be, and I should start by saying there hasn't been research um, with these more advanced populations and specifically extended LSVT loud. Um, I would say as a clinician that it could even be more difficult because uh, we really want to make sure that we're able to shape and model as much as possible. Um, especially early on in treatment. So if an individual is only coming in two times a week, we're not getting as much time with them to make sure that their productions are really, um, really well, really healthy productions, and that's what we want to make sure that they're doing because we don't want to only see a patient for two times a week and then have them go home and do all the, the homework they're doing before we see them again if we're not positive that they have those good vocal productions. So what I would almost caution um, doing that method uh, with this population because you do want to spend more time really shaping that good quality loudness with these patients. Now I do like your point about would ex the extended plan be better due to fatigue. Um, so with that I would say if fatigue is a concern I would lean more towards using telehealth sessions um, where you supplement some of the in-person sessions um, with doing it over the internet and clinicians can be trained in that. We call it LSVT eLoud. Um, so we use um, some type of uh, internet program where it's a video chat option basically and you're getting the treatment. The patient is in their home um, setting and the clinician is, uh, is in their work environment. Um, so that way that the patient doesn't have to come in to all the sessions. Um, also if a clinician can come to the home setting um, would also be helpful with that. Um, so those would be some other ways that I would recommend more for that fatigue side of it um, as opposed to doing the LSVT Loud Extended. Um, I didn't see any other questions come in. Oh, we do have a hand raised, so let me see um, if I can pull up this individual. Okay, so Wendy Weiberg, uh, I have unmuted your microphone if you can ask your question out loud. Thank you. Yes, I did type this question in as well, but I was wondering if Medicare covers eLoud yet. So that's a great question. So does Medicare cover LSVT eLoud, which is um, what I was just talking about, the telehealth uh, version of LSVT Loud, and Medicare does not yet. Um, ASHA is working hard, so ASHA is the national body, uh, governing body for speech language pathologists, and ASHA is working hard to advocate for telehealth sessions to be reimbursed by Medicare, but currently it is not reimbursed by Medicare. Um, some private insurance companies do, but that's dependent on the state. Um, so yes, yeah, so the answer to your question is unfortunately not. That would be uh, private pay um, for, for individuals. Okay, thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. All right, and let me just make sure. Um, Okay, so we have one last question. Heather, if you want to take this one. Um, once a patient is trained in LSVT loud and LSVT big, how often should they go back 
to their um, either physical or speech therapist for a tune-up? So that would be a very individualized um, decision that's made with you and your therapist. Um, speaking as a physical therapist, I can tell you that generally our patients who are in the later stages um, or having more challenges post-DBS, we ask them to come back in about three months and no longer than six months. Um, and in our patients who are, um, you know, younger onset, newly diagnosed, not having as many challenges, we generally have them come back six months to one year. Um, I can't speak for speech. Maybe Beth could give you a little insight onto that. Yeah, so speech, um, we would... Again, it would be very personalized um, between the clinician and the patient, um, but we would check back usually in two to three months just to see how an individual is doing, and depending on how they're doing, that's when we may have them come back in for a tune-up, or we may just say, okay, you sound great, continue on your way, I'll check back in at the six-month mark. Um, so it, it really just is dependent on uh, that clinician and, and patient relationship and how the patient is doing. Sometimes we'll have patients call um, and they just need almost um, to get revved up to do their homework again um, because after treatment, uh, patients continue to do homework. So it might just be they fall off the wagon of continuing to do their homework. And it might just be having the clinician um, remind them and get them back into that homework groove. Sometimes it is coming back in for a tune-up. Um, but I would say a clinician should check in with you about two to three months um, and then at the six-month mark um, and then again two to three months after that to see how you're doing. Okay, and one other question came in. Um, so are we allowed to bill for telehealth LSVT eLoud if a patient has Medicare? So that I'm going to double check before I um, give you an answer. We have a couple really good reimbursement experts on our team because I know there have been, we've been working with ASHA on this specifically um, because there are some issues with if a patient has Medicare uh, and, and then not being able to receive um, services from a provider who doesn't take Medicare, and then also specifically with telehealth. Um, so I don't want to give you a definitive answer right now, but I have your email address, and I will um, get back to you on that with a more uh, complete answer so that you know for sure um, the response to that. Okay, and I think we've addressed all the other questions that have come in, um, but again, if you have other questions, please email us. It's info at lsvtglobal.com. Um, and we do hope that you can attend future webinars. Just going to pull up our final slide here so you have the information. Um, and again, this will be emailed to you in a handout form. Um, but we do hope you can attend other webinars. We've enjoyed having you here today. Um, and feel free again to visit our website and to contact us with any other questions. So thank you for your time.